live from Boston, Massachusetts, it's theCUBE, covering IFS World Conference 2019. Brought to you by IFS. Welcome back to Boston, everybody. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in live tech coverage. This is day one coverage of the IFS World Conference. Darren Roos is here, he's the CEO of IFS. Darren, thanks for coming back in theCUBE. Great to be here again. So last year was your first year. Uh, you kind of laid out your vision at the, the World Conference. Um, how's progress? Yeah, look, it's going incredibly well. We were really focused on how we go from being a pretty fragmented global business um, to being uh, you know, an integrated business where we uh, were able to operate uh, you know, at scale globally in a very uh, homogenous way where the customer experience was the same irrespective of where they engaged with us. Um, and you know, we've made a tremendous amount of progress with that. So you know, the business is growing really strongly. Net revenue's up 22 odd percent year on year. Our license revenue's up 40% year on year. Our cloud's up in the triple digits. So, you know, it's, it's, it's tough to be critical of, uh, of, of how it's going so far. Well, that's great, congratulations. I mean, you're growing faster than your peers. I think the stat was, you gave us 3X faster. 3X, yeah. Than the, than the industry, which yep. is awesome. Is that, I mean, is that your primary benchmark? You want to you gain share, you want to go faster than the big whales, I presume, right? I think two things. One is customer satisfaction, uh, we believe, is the key indicator of long-term success. Um, so, you know, we're the number one ranked ERP and FSM on Gartner Peer Insights. Uh, that's, that, that is and always will be my number one metric. Can we be, you know, we, we, are we the number one from a customer satisfaction perspective? And then I believe the revenue stats will follow, and, you know, that's where we are. So, certainly, if you look at our, our core peers, uh, the, the big ERP vendors, all of them are flat. Um, and we're growing, you know, 22%. So. One of the things you mentioned in your CUBE interview last year was one, one of the things that you wanted to focus on was, I'll call it regional alignment. Um, and Paul and I, we used to work for IDG, I worked for IDC, you were editor-in-chief of Computer World, and we worked for a company who had more offices overseas yes. than IBM. Yeah. And it was really hard to herd the cats. And that yes. was one of the things that you cited. Um, have you been able to get people generally pulling the, the, the ore yeah. at the same time, and, and how has that affected your business? Yeah, look, I think the big challenge before I arrived was that there wasn't really a strategy, a global strategy for the business. Um, IFS had a way of working, and there was a strong culture, but there wasn't really a strategy, and obviously, you know, it's, it's difficult to be critical of, of people when they're not following the strategy when there isn't one. Um, <laughs> so, you know, step one was really making sure that we had a strategy, um, and that was really about being focused on the five industries that we focused on, focused on three solutions, um, and focused on the seg segment of, of customer, which was half a billion to five billion. So now globally, uh, you know, irrespective of the office that you go to, um, anywhere in the world, they're focused on those five industries, they're focused on those three solutions, and they're focused on that customer segment. So, you know, that, that, it, it helps when there's a clear message. That is a good start. <laughs> I, I said during our preview video, video this morning that I've been around this industry as long as, as IFS has, yes. and until last year I'd never even heard of yep. you. Is that just me being clueless, no. or is there something there that no, needs we, to be addressed? No, we were just saying before we started that we're, we're the, definitely the biggest software business you've never heard of. Um, and, uh, and, and that's common, I think, you know, we, we're, there are a couple of factors. One is that the business was very European-centric, um, and, and it didn't really engage in, in a tremendous amount of marketing and, and media presence. So, you know, those are elements that uh, you know, I think we're doing a better job of now, uh, but we have a long way to go. The challenge that we have is, is that where we compete, uh, we win. When we get in and we're able to tell our story and we're able to show the value, we win. Uh, we just don't get into as many deals as we need to, and, and that's the challenge we have. You, you, there was a lot of talk this morning about the importance of those five pillars, of those five industries. Yes. If you're going to become the next SAP, you're going to have to branch out beyond that. What, what yeah. is your thinking about diversifying? Yeah, so becoming the next SAP is definitely not my ambition. <laughs> um, you know, I think we, we, we remain focused on customer satisfaction, and you know, I think that there's, a, there's a different, uh, whatever it is leading them, it's not customer satisfaction. Um, uh, and you so, worked there for four years. And I worked point, there for yeah. four years, so I know. Um, <laughs> I think the, the big thing for me is, is that we, we've got to stay focused on that customer voice, stay focused on what delivers value for our customers beyond just the rhetoric and hyperbole. Um, you know, I think w w when, you, when you listen to a lot of the, 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 the complexity that our customers are facing today, any customers are facing, companies are facing increasingly disruptive times and, and the tech industry is making life more difficult for them. The more best of breed solutions get built, the more fragmented that potential IT landscape is, the more complex it becomes for customers. If they have to try and figure out how do we integrate these things and derive value from this highly fragmented landscape. 
So, you know, we, we're, we're trying to solve that problem. How do, how do we make it easier for customers to challenge in their industry, and that's where this whole for the challengers hashtag comes from. How do we help them to be disruptive in their industry, have competitive advantage? There seems to be a, a, a sort of a fundamentally different thing about your approach, though, is this focus on those vertical industries. Yes. Most ERP companies did not do that. Yeah. Is that something that is core to your values? Yeah. Look, I think what we recognize is that as you move to the cloud, you have to drive fit to standard. That's just the reality of going to the cloud. Um, and what's happening for the horizontal ERP vendors, so the, the likes of SAP and Oracle, is that they have one ERP solution that fits every industry. So if it's good for health insurance and it's good for a bank, then it's difficult to really get your head around the fact that it could be good for a defense manufacturer. Mm -hmm. right? The functional requirements is simply vastly different. Um, and that means that you have to customize it. And if you have to customize it, they can't go to the cloud. So what we believe is, is that you have to have this vertical specialization. The five industries that we service all have a lot of commonality in the processes that they use. And that's why that vertical strategy is so key to our success. So you won't see us going into financial services or healthcare or retail with that core application. We may, in, in time, in, in, in many years to come, branch out, but it'll be a different solution set. So you'll tailor that app or that module for that industry. Yes. You'll go deep, deep functionality, yes. you're known for that. But at the same time, you're also messaging you want your customers to be able to tailor the, yes. for their environment. So square that circle for me, Darren. Yeah. So I think um, when we talk about uh, choice, and, and, and I think tailoring is the wrong word, when we talk about choice, we're talking about choice of deployment on-prem or in the cloud, choice of customer, uh, choice of partner rather, who are they going to deploy with, um, and then the, the solution is, is really uh, an industry solution that comes with that functional depth, and we don't, we don't advocate that customers customize that at all. We really don't want them to customize it. What we explain to them in, in some detail is that the real value comes from adopting the solution fit to standard and, and staying on a vanilla application because that vanilla application you're going to be able to withstand future upgrades, the total cost of ownership gets lower, the, 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 the processes that are embedded in that application are best to breed out the box. That's what they're intended to do. Cool. Um, and that works when you have a vertical application. When you have a horizontal application and you're trying to have it do things that it shouldn't naturally be doing, that becomes complex. Well, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but wasn't that essentially the message SAP had when it went through its hyper growth in the late 90s? I mean, there was a Y2K thing there too, but a lot of the message was around do it our way and, and then you don't have to, to get stuck in a rut. Yeah, so I think that the, when SAP came out with that generation of application, that certainly was what they had hoped would happen. But what happened in, in practice is that the system integrators came in and the whole uh, business process re-engineering um, explosion happened. Um, and, and, and that's not how it, re, how it manifested itself. So what you see is you see these very large monolithic SAP applications that were customized over, in some cases, decades. Not, not you know, if, if, if a customer is deploying fit to standard, then they should be able to deploy in a period measured in weeks. You know, we spoke about our deployment with Racing Point, the F1 team, and going live in 12 weeks. Uh, you know, we're a 700 million uh, global business. We deployed in IFS in 24 weeks. Um, you know, if a customer is deploying fit to standard, it's measured in weeks. As soon as they start to talk about two years or three years or five years or seven years, they're customizing the solution significantly. Yeah, I mean, it became just sort of a perpetual upgrade, maintenance, and now for the time, it had a business impact, but boy, you think of cloud today, agility, yep. you know, getting rid of waterfall approaches. Yes. I mean, it's just antithetical to today's environment. I think, look, it, it, the, what's, what's, uh, I, I, I don't point fingers here. I think the, the, there's just maturity come with experience. Um, the line of business um, applications, your CRMs and your HR solutions, um, have taught people that you can, if you think about it, let, let's just look at CRM as an example. You had Siebel before, and people would implement Siebel. They would customize Siebel. It would take long implementations. They were highly bespoke applications and then Salesforce came along and just destroyed them. And they destroyed them because what people learned very quickly was that there was a really easy to consume, really easy to use application that functionally might be inferior, but the, the compromises that you'd make from a functionality perspective were way outweighed um, by that time to value and ease of use. And, and, and the learnings from CRM and HR and procurement, those line of business applications, are, have now been backed into in the ERP world. So in terms of capital allocation, you're owned by private equity, which yes. is actually a public company. Yes. Um, I'm interested in how you're allocating capital, R&D, where your, where your emphasis is. You don't have to do, you don't have to do stock buybacks, no. but, but 
you know, describe the, that PE relationship. Yeah, so look, I, I, one of my learnings as CEO of IFS is that not all private equity firms are equal. Uh, they have different strategies. I'm very fortunate to be with uh, EQT, who are a growth investor. They're known as a growth investor, um, and, and, and they buy companies that are uh, strong growth tech firms. Um, and they've been hugely supportive of us investing because they understand um, that the investment in the technology is important. So, you know, just looking at some detail, um, Today, we invest twice as much in R&D as we did three years ago, just to give you a, a, you know, one data point. So there's a big focus on, on technology. And the thing is, is that we, we have to invest in technology to drive those attributes that I discussed earlier. How do we, how do we enable customers to uh, adopt the solution, fit to standards so they can go live quicker? How do we enable customers to be able to sit down in, the app, in front of the application like we do with a mobile phone and intuitively know how to use it? How do we reduce the total cost of ownership through automation? Those those are capabilities that, you know, they don't come for free. We have to invest in them. So, well, big investments in, in technology. Well, and I think the private equity guys, at least the modern ones, have realized, like, why should the VCs have all the fun? They, they realize, hey, we can yeah. actually put some money into R&D, transform it, we can have a, a bigger exit and actually make much better returns than sucking the company dry. Yeah. Right? Well, mean, look, I think the other thing is, is that you know, in, in public companies, you have the downside of you know, there's this quarterly metric um, and, and this quarterly uh, cadence, um, and, and you see very compromising decisions being made because you know, people can't afford to miss one quarter. There's no long-term planning that's done, um, and that's fundamentally not the case. In the private equity world, you know, not unusual now for, for PE firms to hold companies for five, six, seven, eight years. Um, and that allows you to take a very long-term strategic view. If, if, if a shift from perpetual to subscription is the right thing to happen, they can do that without worrying that, you know, because of the dip in earnings or revenue that you're going to get caned by the market next quarter. Um, and I think that that leads to, I think, better decision making for the long term. Well, a lot of companies are struggling with that. If you have the right yeah. PE firm, Absolutely. right? Because if you have the a right lot PE of firm, companies that get bought by no, PE firms right. eventually want to go public again. You're 100% right. But the, um, the, uh, you said something this morning that 50% of your customers each year are net new. Yes. How are you pulling that off? That's yeah, a pretty so, remarkable uh, 50 number. 50% of our license revenue. Um, so uh, we, we, win, uh, we win about uh, 300 odd um, new customers a year. Um, obviously that's growing, as I said, you know, 40 odd percent. But uh, you know, it, it, it's, uh, I think having done this for 25 years, there are companies that are, are, are good at extracting revenue from their install base. One of the analysts here uh, has, has a hashtag wallet fracking, uh, is what he refers <laughs> it to it as, which I think is such a great term. Um, so, you know, they, they, they're good at wallet fracking, and, and, and I think the customers that, that, that are customers of those vendors know exactly who they are. Um, and, 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 you know, I, I think that uh, for us to, the, the fact that we're able to go out and win 50% of our license revenue from net new name customers, I think is a really strong indicator of the health of the business. It's much harder to do than just extracting revenue out of the install base. Um, you know, we don't have a compliance practice. We've never charged a customer for indirect access. Um, you know, and these are, are, are principles that we stand by. And it's easier to say that you're customer centric um, and then get 80% of your revenue out of your install base because you're doing compliance rounds. Um, but you know, we put our money where our mouth is and that's not, that's so not are, how we do it. Are these net new customers, are they, are they migrating from QuickBooks or are they migrating from a competitor? No, because of the segment that we're in, this half a billion to five billion, uh, I would say the majority of them are what I would call first generation ERP solutions. So you know, you're talking about um, you know, the, the original generation of, of Microsoft's acquisitions and the Visions and the Exaptors and the Solomons and so on. Um, and then you know, SAP R2 and R3 customers, you're talking about customers sitting on uh, you know, uh, the, the, the solutions that in for hoovered up the Mapix, Bpix type customers, AS400 mm -hmm. customers. Mm -hmm. So they're, you know, they're first generation ERP solutions that simply don't have the flexibility to deal with the complexity and demands of a modern business world. From 2009 to about 2017, IFS was pretty acquisitive. Yeah. And then, just actually I was going to ask you. you when know, I stopped What about it. on your tenure? You stopped yeah. it, right. But then, you know, today you announced an acquisition, yes. small acquisition, but how should we think about M&A? Yeah, so look, the, the, the first year for me was really about trying to build a functional business. You know, mm -hmm. we spoke about how fragmented this really heterogeneous business, um, and it just occurred to me, you know, if we go out and we start to buy things, how, how do we integrate them into a business that's completely fragmented? You know, it had no identity or culture. So, you know, the last year has been focused on how do we build that common understanding of what it is that we're doing 
We now have a very clear strategy, five industries, three solutions, one segment. Um, and uh, you know, when you, when you have that clarity of vision, then it's really easy to go out and do M&A because you know what fits and what doesn't fit. You can understand exactly how you're going to build value for customers. Um, and, and that's why the SDR uh, deal is, is so good for us because we're now the undisputed leader in, in field service management. Uh, you know, uh, 8,000 odd customers globally, which is way more than anybody else has got. Um, and uh, you know, you should absolutely expect more from us, but it will be in the five industries, three technology segments and, and one customer size segment. Well, on the API enablement, should obviously facilitate yes, that, right? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I was, I was just with uh, a partner of ours now, and they have this amazing augmented reality solution. Um, and you know, it'll be a combination of, of, of going out there to build market share, um, a, as well as finding you know, uh, really innovative solutions that can help us advance the technology that we, we provide customers. You have a new slogan this year, For the Challengers, which seems to be aimed at companies that, that uh, imagine themselves as, as challenging the giants which is great, but if you're not a company that sees, sees themselves that yes. way, are they still, they still have a home with IFS? Um, look, I, I think uh, I was with a, a group of um, CEOs from, from a, uh, one of the big analyst firms, um, and uh, they, they had the portfolio companies, and um, uh, they have a private equity firm and an analyst firm. And the CEOs of their companies, I'm having a conversation with them about digital transformation. Um, and uh, I, I made a rather provocative statement, which you know got unanimous agreement, which is that all of the CEOs there were either in an industry that was being disrupted and were trying to figure out how they respond to that disruption, or they would soon not have a job. And they all acknowledged that they absolutely fit into that category. In other words, all of them were being disrupted. All of them were facing a challenge. It was kind of like, you know, it, it, it is happening to all of us at a, at, at a more rapid pace than we've ever had before. So my view is, is that you know, if, if, if you're in the room and you're going, you know, IFS might not be for us because we're not a challenger, yeah, the lights may not be on for long. <laughs> so, so double click on that. What, what role does IFS play in terms of digital transformation specifically. So if I could just build on yeah, that yeah, question. Because yeah. the thing is there are leaders, right? In my mind there are challenges and there are leaders. The leaders typically are going to go with the safe solution. They're going to go with one of the legacy ERPs. So I'm not suggesting that everybody necessarily is a challenger. Uh, there are leaders, you know. Um, Nokia was a leader until they weren't because they were complacent. Um, and I think they, you know, well they didn't run on IFS. So, you know, I think th th there are two segments. There are leaders and there are challengers and, and we're there for the ones that are ready to disrupt. Mm -hmm. Sorry, if I could just clarify that. No, no, good. So, so again, back to sort of digital transformation and disruption. What, what do you see as the role of ERP generally, but specifically IFS? Look, I think we digital transformation. We have a lot of discussion about it on the stage this morning. Um, I've just touched on it now. I think that it takes very different forms. Um, what most industries are finding is, is that they're facing a lot of non-traditional competition, and they're having to innovate around their business models. They can't go to market in the same way as they did before. They're having to innovate because of this non-traditional competition. Um, and understanding your your customers, understanding your, your your staff, understanding your supply chain, understanding your financials are all critical parts of being able to respond to whatever that change is. And, and, and that's where an ERP solution comes into it. I think there's an interesting um, challenge now, which is that as those applications have become more fragmented and you've got more best of breed cloud applications, uh, a lot of the value of an ERP was that you had this integrated set of applications, that you had this one source of the truth. Um, and unfortunately for many customers today, they don't have that because they've gone and bought all of these best of breed applications and they don't have one source of the truth. They have multiple invoices, made it multiple versions of their customer in their databases um, and, and, and we still stand for a single integrated ERP. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think understanding those elements of your business is key. I was with a customer of ours in Nebraska a short while ago and they were talking about, the existing IFS customer, they were talking about the steel uh, import duties that were imposed through the, the trade wars with China. And um, they were saying, look, that they had been able to respond to that in a way that they had good visibility of their supply chain, who was uh, impl uh, imposing the tariffs, uh, how they were going to impact them, and when they were going to impact them. And because they had this integrated CR uh, ERP, they were able to pass those pricing changes onto their customers, and they survived this, what could have been a cataclysmic event for their business. Um, had they not had an integrated ERP, if they'd not been able to have this visibility into the supply chain and the customer base, they may well have gone out of business just because of that one change. And to me, it all, Darren, it all comes back to the data. You're putting, they're putting yeah. data at the core of their business, that integrated data pipeline is essentially what they get out of that yes. integrated ERP. Um, 
Last question, so thinking about the next 18 to 24 months, what are the milestones that observers should look for? What are the, the barometers that we should be watching? Yeah. So look, in the next uh, two years, it's, it's really about us building incremental scale. We have a, a four-year plan, which I built when I came in. We're halfway through that plan. Uh, we've hit all of the metrics and, in, and exceeded most of the metrics that we had on that plan. It's really continue to focus on the strategy, as I said. We focus on those five industries, continue to build market share, um, continue to focus on those three solution types and, and, and build market share and, and, and market dominance on those three solutions um, and in that segment that I defined before. So no, no change from a strategy perspective. I think there's real value in, in the consistency that we bring on, on that talk track. Um, and you know, along the way, we passed the billion dollar mark, which we, we will do, I think, in 2021. Uh, organically, if, if, if we accelerate some of the M&A, we'll pass the billion before. Um, but you know, it, the business, the, the margins continue to expand. Uh, we focus on customer satisfaction satisfaction and you know it's, it's it's a it's a pretty straight you know traditional playbook that we have to execute on now well congratulations it's it's a, it's a great playbook and you're growing very nicely so love that love we really an honor to the last couple of years learn a little bit about your thank company you. and your industry so appreciate it's a pleasure you coming to be on with you guys thank you all right and thank you for watching we're, we're right back with our next guest right after this short break Dave Vellante with Paul Gillen you're watching the cube from IFS World Conference from Boston 2019 be right back